Truly, we thank God tonight. And we're going to. Well, we don't endeavor to be before you very long. But just something, as we say, that hit me a while back, and I had mentioned it to Pastor and Brother Rodney, as we say that many times we as people, and I know that you see it all the time, that people come to church and they seem to be being blessed of the Lord. The next thing you know, they're gone. You have no idea where they went or anything else. And the Lord spoke to me and said, don't leave the house of bread. Where you're being fed, don't leave. Doesn't make any difference what's going on in your life. Don't leave God. Doesn't make any difference how many people talk about you, leave you, forsake you. Don't leave God. Be as wise as Peter when Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And 70 of his disciples walked away. Jesus turned to the 12 and said, will you also go? Peter said, Lord, where are we going? For thou hast the words of eternal life. In other words, if you leave the house of bread, you're lost. And there is no help outside of the house of bread. It doesn't make any difference where you go and who you look to and how many of the other people you depend on. When you leave the house of bread, you're on your way to a devil's hell. Too many times we want to look and say, well, this one or that one, and if that preacher had said this and if he'd said that, you can't lay it to anybody else's charge. My mother used to sing a little song back when I was little. She said, you got a Bible, you better read it. Say, if you don't pray and your soul be lost, it's nobody's fault but yours. Too many of us are trying to read individuals rather than reading the word. And see, the key is this. I don't care how anointed that preacher is. He doesn't have everything you need. Jesus does. It was Jesus that hung on that cross and paid the price for your salvation. He said, if any man, in the book of James, he said, if any man like wisdom, let him ask of God who give it to all men liberally and abrade him not. In other words, he does not do it by partiality. He does not do it by nepotism or favoritism. In other words, if you're lacking in God, Get on your knees, enter into your secret closet, and pray to him who is in secret, and he will reward you openly. Too many of us are wanting somebody else to pray us through. No, you pray yourself through. What is wrong with the church, many instances, we do not have a personal revelation of Jesus Christ in our lives. See, I don't care how anointed an individual may be. The revelation that God gives him will not meet all of my needs. And too many of us feel like, well, if the pastor don't have it, I can't make it. If the pastor fail, what's the use in me trying? Some of us said it like the Baptist did many, many years ago when they sung his song. Talking about that old time religion, say it was good enough for mama. It was good enough for daddy. It may have been for what they knew, but for what you know, it's not good enough. See, maybe they hadn't come into the full understanding of what it means to be baptized into the Holy Ghost. Maybe they had never experienced the healing power of God being manifested in their bodies. Maybe they hadn't searched God or found him enough until the anointing of God flowed through their lives that when they laid hands on somebody, somebody got healed. Somebody got delivered. Demons were cast out. But see, when you go to the house of bread, it has everything you need. There's water in the house of bread. You see, when they came to the temple in the Old Testament, there was an altar of fire that burned up the sacrifice. But before that sacrifice could be altered up, it had to die. There had to be a shedding of blood. But though the sacrifice was made, the offering was burned. The atonement was not yet complete until the high priest came down, got that blood. But he had to be pure himself. He had to be washed. 
And those priests that were doing the sling, they had to wash. They had to go by that brazen labor. They had to be washed. They had to be clean. That high priest, he didn't, he didn't come through there like some of us do, slushing through the mud and blood, and then walk straight into, and then walk straight into the Holy of Holies. But isn't that the way some of us come? We don't come repentant. We don't seek God's anointing. We don't seek his favor. We don't offer up anything in the line that God has told us. Somebody said, well, you don't have to. But let me tell you something. John said, go back and bring forth meat worthy of repentance. In other words, who warned you to flee the wrath of God? But in talking about leaving the house of bread, I just kind of like to take you back to the book of Ruth. First chapter, I believe it is. And down through about the six verses, and I won't read it per se, but Naomi and Emily, they left, and their sons left the house of bread and went into the land of Moab. See, just because there's a few things that's getting tight in your life, the temperature's being turned up, the screws are being tightened, that's no time for you to leave the house of bread. But this is what happens to many of us. When things aren't going our way, as the pressure begins to test, in that time of testing, we have a tendency to run away and get out. And some of us like to reach over into the New Testament and get this scripture and only quote part of it. When he said, there is no temptation that has overtaken you except that which is common to man. And with every temptation, I made a way of escape. And that's where we stop. He said that you may be able to bear it. God's not going to put something on you that he does not give you grace to endure. That's where you're missing it, church, when you begin to run away because God, hadn't answered your prayer just the way you think he ought to answer it. Too many of us are saying, well, I gave God three months. God's gave you a lifetime and you still ain't got it right. He gave you the Holy Ghost and you still haven't got it right. So why are you trying to limit God on a time frame? Why don't you be like Job? When Job had an idea, but he was a little wrong. He said, though you slay me yet, I'm going to trust you. He was accusing God of, as we say, these afflictions. But God, God allowed them, but God didn't send them. In other words, how many of us take that approach? Why God letting this happen to me? Why God put this on me? Many times it's your sin that brought it on you. It's not God. See, when sin is in the camp, people suffer. It may not be you that's suffering for the sins that you committed. It may be your children, because that's the only way God can get your attention. Too many of us want to leave the house of bread. We say, God, I've been praying for that child for 20 years. And it looks like he gets worse every time I pray for him. Did you ever think of being an example? You see, they used a phrase back when, I, when most of us in here were children. Those of you under 40 probably won't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but they said this, don't do as I do, do, do as I say. <laughs> well, why do this or why do that? Because I said so. And if you had any more questions, it may have been. Brother, bring me that belt. Go get me a switch. I'll teach you when I tell you something, you don't question what I say. How many times do we take that approach? Well, God, if God ain't going to do it, I'm just leaving. You know, that's something my mother never did give, give me the option of, take, of taking a whipping. If I needed it, I got it, unless she forgot. But then she seemed to have an awful good memory. Because two or three months later, I done done something else. And she said, and remember when I told you about such and such? <laughs> I thought I had gotten by, but I didn't get away. Some of us think because God don't punish us right now, we've gotten away. Not so. But I want you to know, when you start talking about leaving the house of bread, you've, lo you've left your only source of hope in this world and in this life. Because the, I'm going to tell you, if you lose the hope that is in this life of you making it to the other one, it's over. 
And after all the things that Naomi went through, she lost her husband. Then she lost both of her sons. And then she decided, I believe I'll go back home. I'll go back because she had heard rumor that there was bread again in the land of Israel. There was bread in the house of Bethlehem of Judea. And that's why I chose that subject because Bethlehem of Judea meant the house of bread. So when you get started talking and you want to know, it's a gathering place, church. Way back they used to tell us that on Sundays, it was called Saints Feeding Day. We worked six days a week. But on Sunday, we came to be fed. We came to be blessed. We came looking in expectation, knowing that God was going to meet our physical and spiritual needs. And too many times today, oh, well, I'm going because I know I'm supposed to go. That's, make it, that's not good enough. I'm going to do this because, well, it said it, and it makes me look pious. But when you go to the house of God, you ought to go to worship. Amen. You ought to go to worship. See, sometimes we think worship, it, 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 you know, is just running the aisles. That's a form of worship. And we think many times that when we're speaking in tongues and all of that, all of that is a part of worship. Oh, but you may sit there and worship God and not open your mouth until he gives you, you to quietly walk over to some sister or brother in the church that is in extreme pain and you had no idea, and no one else in the church has any idea of the sickness or the pain that someone else is going through. Amen. But that person got up and moved and began to lay hands on, on that sick individual or that, that individual that was burdened down. That's worship. When the Spirit of God moves upon you and in you, that you can reach out and touch others. Because see, then that gives me to know, and it gives you, should give you to know, and anyone else, that you have been in the house of bread. Not only have you been in the house of bread, but you have been feasting at the Lord's table. See, too many of us go to the house of bread, but we don't feast. One thing y'all can't say, when you, at least when you look at me, you can't say, boy, he sure looks like, say, well, we know one thing. He doesn't fast when he go to the house of bread, does he? But you see, you can be, as my mother used to use the phrase, as poor as Job's turkey. Somebody asked the question, say, how poor was he? Somebody said he was so poor he had to lean on the fence to gobble. But the point of it is this. You can look flat and flourishing and be just as dead and empty on the inside as you want to be. Somebody said, ooh, ooh, you see? Somebody walked, once told me, say, hadn't seen me for a while. They said, well, it don't look like you missed any meals. I, di I didn't miss them on purpose, per se. <laughs> Unless, now there are times when I will miss meals on purpose. And I don't mean just one. But there are times, as we say, when the Spirit of the Lord will move upon me to fast, as we say. And it, it, may, it may be as many as we say anywhere from one to nine or ten meals. But the key is this. I want it to be of God's leading. There are times when I have done it on my own. Because I wanted something from the Lord. But you have to be careful when you're fasting that you don't get in yourself and start doing it. I worked with a man some years ago and he left and he went to Arkansas and he decided he was going on a two week fast. Well, any of you all know anything about the South, you don't work outside and deprive your body of food and water that long as we say, 8, 10, or 12 hour days, physically working hard. You just don't do it. I can't say where he went. I'd like to think he went with the Lord. But see, if you do things out of the will of God, I'm not going to say where you went. Because only God knows your heart. I believe he was trying to do the right thing. But as I say, when we come to the house of bread, don't leave because Brother Marvin don't like you. Don't leave because I can't stand Brother Joe. 
Brother Joe didn't make hell to put me in. Not only that, Brother Joe can't send me there. And note this. If he didn't make it for you and he can't send you there, he sure can't get you out. You go there of your own choosing. And this is what's wrong with too many of us. We go in our own choosing. And I'm not, as I said, I don't endeavor to be before you very long at all. There was just a few scriptures and a few thoughts that we say that really reigned in my mind and as I was thinking of some things, I thought about how that when we get to the New Testament and in the, matter of fact, in one of the last scriptures as we say in the Old Testament that I was thinking about, I was thinking about the 23rd Psalms when he talked about thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Why don't you let God prepare the table before you? All those people that you feel like can't stand you or you can't stand, why don't you let God prepare a table for you and then partake of what he's giving? Because see, where there's love, you don't have to worry about it. But where there's hate, he'll give love. Where there's confusion, he'll bring peace. See, too many of us are running around feeling like, well, and I gave them a piece of my mind. No wonder you're in the mess you're in. Too many times we're saying, I believe God will heal me. And turn right around and say, but I wonder when. Lord, I've been praying for this for the last five years and I ain't healed yet. Well, God made Abraham a promise. It was roughly 25 years before Abraham saw the promise fulfilled. But I want to bring it down a little closer to you. Over in the 2 Corinthians, about the 12th chapter, when Paul said, I sought the Lord three times concerning this thorn in the flesh. Two times we don't find where God answered him. The third time God said, my grace is sufficient. In other words, whatever your needs are, I'm able, to, I'm able to keep you. I will sustain you in the midst of your trials, in the midst of your tribulation. But you have got to learn to come to the house of bread. You have got to learn to partake of the bread that God is feeding. Another little scripture we say I like to think about is we say in the New Testament, I'm just going to kind of brush through them, but most of you all will know what I'm talking about. If you look at the feeding of the 5,000, he made them sit down. He told his disciples, he said, we love that story about the two fish and the five loaves of bread, but there was another feeding. And actually, we can look at both of those feedings, and it's what Jesus did. He first took the little bit of small amount of bread or whatever they had, he blessed it, and then he broke it, and then he imparted it to his disciples, and he told them, you departed, um, you parted amongst the people. God is saying to those of you that are sitting in the pews out here tonight, I've given it to my servants up here. I've given it to those over there. I've given it to some of you. Now you go and part to others what I have given you. Freely you have received, freely give. In other words, don't worry about whether you think they're worthy of it or not. Because see, that was a day when I was so unworthy. But God looked down through the spans of time and had mercy on me. There are times even now that I will fail God, but yet he looks down on me through eyes of love, through eyes of compassion. All because I continually keep coming to the house of bread and offering to up a sacrifice that is acceptable to him. That sacrifice that I offer up is my life in his name through his blood. You see, my, my, all the other sacrifices I offer up ain't worth nothing. But see, when I come to him who did no sin and neither was God found in his mouth, God recognizes that. God honors that. And then I have to strive. See, somebody feels like, well, it's all of faith once you get there. No, there's some works that go along with your faith. You see, because faith without, faith without works is dead. 
Works without faith is dead. But they complement each other. Paul said, show you, you know, show me your works. He said, and then I'll show you my faith by my works. Faith will produce a work in your life. A righteous work. A godly work. And see, and there are so many of us that we are dutifully bound in dutifully being religious, but they're not necessarily the, the works that God would have us do. And somebody's looking at me funny because I don't care how much you come to church. I don't care how much money you put in when you get here. I don't care how many of all these other religious things you do. But what about when he told you to go into the highways and hedges and compel those to come that don't know? If you've been in the house of bread and you've been feasting at the Lord's table, you ought to have something to give to somebody else. I had a young man call me, I believe a week or so ago. He said, Elder, he said, I know he was in some little group. I don't know. They got this thing on the, over the Internet and stuff, and they be online, as we say, socializing. That's what I call it. I don't call it gospel or nothing else. But they'd be online socialized, maybe presumably talking about the word of God and all of this. And he said a question arose and he wasn't sure. So I was one of the first people that we said it crossed his mind. He said, because I know if anybody know, you know. And I told him, <laughs> I said, well, I'll help you if I can. So then he proceeds to tell me. And I explained it to him, gave him scripture for what I was talking about. He said, well, I knew you knew. And then he wanted me to join their little group. And I told him, I said, well, brother, I got one question to ask you. Are you growing spiritually? He didn't have an answer. Well, like, what do you mean growing spiritually? I said, growing religious intellect is not growing spiritually. You can, you can explain this book from A, as they say, from A to Z, or from Genesis to Revelation. But if you have no personal revelation of Jesus Christ and how that he is to abide in you, all of that intellect is vain. Somebody said, well, now I don't believe that. Well, all you got to do is go over to 1 Corinthians and begin to read. When he said, for the natural man receiveth not the things of God, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. You want to know something about God? Get into his word. Meditate. Day and night. Not just one day. Day and night. It's a continual process. 24-7. And there was something, as we say initially, as we say, I'm going to say this, and Brother Tom, I'm not going to hold you up tonight. At least I don't intend to. But there was something that I it just kind of put down that kind of ran across my mind. You see, don't leave the house of bread. God has prepared a table. And he sent out the invitations. And note this. If you don't RSVP, you're not going to abide at this dinner very long. See, some of us say, you ain't going to get in. But the Bible gives us to know that on one occasion, a man did get in. And the master came and said, in other words, brother, what are you doing here without a wedding garment? And he said, bind him hands and feet. And let him be cast out into outer darkness. And there is going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You're not going to abide in God's presence if you don't come by the way of the cross. Right. If you don't come through the blood, you're not going to abide in God's house. See, many of us, I think about it, say, no doubt 25 or 30 years ago, some of you were running from church to church. You were looking for a place to go. And if you didn't find it there, you went on over to where somebody else said, oh, the blessings of the Lord are flowing. And you got over there and you found out it wasn't what you wanted. But you see, I thank God that when I came here some years ago, 
been a pretty good time since then. And I think Sister Bobby and I were talking about it the other day. But there was all, most of you all are sitting here tonight. You weren't over on hydraulic. But just look where God has brought us from. Look where God has brought us from. And I, can't, and, I, and I tell people this. I've had people in the black community say, well, like, and I say, well, what are you doing over there? I said, when I walked through the doors that Sunday morning in July, some 11 years ago or better, I felt the presence of God. I knew the presence of God was in this place. And I, have cho- I chose to abide in the house of bread where I know the word is going forth. I may not agree with everything that has been said. I may not agree with everything that has been done. But I know this. I'm far better off today than where I was yesterday. I know it beyond the shadow of a doubt. In other words, you ought to examine yourself. You ought to examine the church that you're attending. Are you being fed? Are you being delivered? Are you being nourished? See, Peter said it. He said, as ba- newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. And I heard this on TV yesterday, and it got my attention because I had never really thought about it. They were talking about all these people. And boy, you mothers, y'all going to sure enough get upset with me. <laughs> they were talking about how that, what was it? Is it Finland or Ireland somewhere? They have now chose that, as we say, by the time your baby is a year old, he should be put, as we say, in public or private daycare. In other words, your bonding days is only a year. Your child has only begun to only, he's just now at the stage to learn. They don't let you went through all the dirty work, but now you can't enjoy none of the fruits. And it's so bad that mothers have, for a long time, well, I want to look good. You better think about being good. Because see, when you get through looking good and you stand before God, and he asked you, I told you to instruct the child and you didn't do it. You see, there's a lot of teaching in the Old Testament of how to rear families. But we've gotten away with them and say, hey, don't take all that. My daughter, she's grown, got kids that's grown. She told me one time when she was a teenager, she said, but daddy, you don't have to whip a person for everything. I said, I don't. She looked at me and I said, well then what, what is, what, what is, I asked her, what's, what recommend? She said, punishment. And then, well, these things, you know, were like, they really didn't matter. Oh. She, she outgrew her adornments, her little ornaments that she adored so well. Those little Cabbage Patch kids, the preemies, the beanie babies, and all of that stuff. And I got a couple of black bags full of them still in my house. Because she's outgrown them and she don't want them. And she, I don't know. I would have enjoyed her giving them to, to my grandkids. I would have got rid of them. But see, the things that we love, and sometimes parents, we don't understand why children love their grandparents so much. Because grandparents will spend and take time and talk to them. Yes. About, many times about the things that they endured. My youngest son told me a few Sundays ago for Father's Day, he said, he had his kids with him, he said, in other words, he, he said, in other words, I have to start visiting and doing things more often so the kids will understand, in a sense, where they came from. But church... The majority of us don't know where we came from. We didn't come from that dime store novel. I knew of a lady that read, I think there was four series or four volumes in the Beyond series. And I think there was like three books in each deal. And each book was about 400 pages long. I know that she read at least three of those series inside of a year. And she didn't read her her Bible through once. You see how the devil get us caught up? You want to talk about beyond, go to Revelation and then flip back to Daniel. And back and forth and steady and see what God has said is going to take place upon this earth. Also, 
he gave us to know. It's because many of us don't realize. We keep saying, well, I've heard that over and over again. But as I once heard a preacher many years ago, he said, the Bible, if you really want to begin to know and understand it as you seek God, you play, rewind, and hit play again. Amen. And you keep doing it over and over and over. Because we are a people that if you're going to learn to, to understand God, you need it done repetitiously. You don't just read this and, oh, I got it. But it's over and over. And after preaching for so many years, you know, there are things that I sometimes look back and wonder. God will drop something instantaneously in my spirit, and I'm wondering, like, Lord, all these years? And sometimes he spoke to me concerning that same thing, and I felt like, I got it. Maybe a week or two later, he dropped something else in there, and, boy, then I really didn't know nothing. <laughs> in other words, how could I have felt like I, as we say, I got it all now, and then a week later, he shows me something else. And this is what's wrong with many of us. We feel like we've got it, and we don't. And one of the things is this. We need to genuinely seek God and his will for our lives. And recognize this. There's going to be lean times in your life. There's going to be hard times. There's going to be trials that are going to come into your life. And the key is this, is that you stay in the house of bread. You continually eat from the Lord's table. And can I pick on pastor for just a little bit? Because he said he don't like liver. If you're anemic, you better start eating some liver. I don't care for spinach. It's kind of funny because I'll eat it raw, but I don't want it cooked. See, and if you need iron, there's certain things, certain foods that will give you, if you eat them, hey, you won't have to be around here going, now I need some water. You won't have to be around here. We say, oh, I'm tired and I'm so run down. And now I'll give you one that most of you don't know anything about. You go out there and find you some good dirt. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. There are certain clays that you can eat that's full of iron. Old folk ate it. Doctors knew it. See, you... We talk about these hologenic medicines. Yeah, they work. Some of y'all run around talking about what you need. And oh, let's see. I need some x -lax. Well, if you'd ate some of that good dirt, that sand, that sand, that sand and that would have ground that stuff up and would have kicked it out the other end. See, now y'all laugh, but see, you learn a few things when you live in the country. You learn a few things when you can't run to the doctor for every, everything that ails you. You learn a few things when you can't run to the preacher and get it, and you got to fall on your knees and say, God, I need help for the situation I'm in. There's going to be some times when you're really not going to know which way to turn other than to God. Yeah. See, you'll come to the end of yourself and feel like, I don't know what else to do. We throw up our hands and say, Lord, I surrender. Lord, I give up. Lord, what is it that I'm missing? Don't, don't throw in the towel, but simply say, Lord, I'm in your hand. I told you all this story a couple of years ago, and I'm closing. I know many of you all remember when I came to church one Wednesday night, and I told you I got attacked by this dog. And we went round and round and round and round. I think I won, and I think he thinks he won, <laughs> but we had a stare down. And we both, I think, were glad of it. But on my way to church that night, because I really shouldn't have came to church that night. Yeah. If the doctors and stuff had been thinking. Because when I left the doctor's office, when I left immediate care, my blood pressure was 71 over 46. I certainly shouldn't have been behind no stern wheel. 
But as I was driving down I-35, one of those old songs that I heard my mother singing back when I was a kid, it said this, I know my life is in God's hands. I know my life is in God's hands. You can't make me doubt him. I know too much about him. I know my life is in God's hands. Is your life in God's hands? If you continue in the house of bread, if you continue eating from the Lord's table, your life is in God's hands and no one can pluck you out. Father, we thank you for your word on this evening. And Lord, we trust that something has been said that will stir the hearts and minds of each one that's here. God, that they will be drawn closer to you. God, that they will partake of your table today. For Lord, there is nothing on your table that is harmful or detrimental. But God, everything that is on your table is meant for our blessings. It's meant for our nourishment. And God, we give you praise and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.